Sometimes there's things in games that are kind of forgettable, but sometimes you need such a big old brain it's impossible to forget. Hi folks, it's Falcon, and today on Game Ranks, 1000 IQ video game moments we never forgot. Before we get going, I just wanted to note a little chicken and egg situation this brings up. Maybe a falcon in the egg. I don't know. Are we remembering these things because they were so tricky that it was notable the amount of effort that needed to be done in order to get through them? Or is it that our brains are so big that we cannot forget? The second would certainly be preferable. It would feel a lot better. But without actually going through these games, we'll never know. So without further ado, Starting off at number 10, the keypad puzzle from Batman Arkham Knight. Now, the Arkham games actually have their fair share of tricky puzzles. Some of the Riddler challenges are no joke whatsoever. The riddles. Ha! Get it? Riddles are not the same thing as a joke. <laughs> yeah, but if I had to pick just one puzzle in these games to make me feel like a genius for figuring it out, it's this one. It's, it's actually not that hard. The solution's fairly obvious, but it's one of those ones that's just really satisfying to solve. And that's kind of a rare thing when it comes to puzzles and games. The basic gist of it is that you're trying to find the code to get into the studio using the camera system. This lock is mechanical with no digital components. I won't be able to use the remote hacking device. Normally, all you would really have to do is zoom in on the guy putting in the code and then just copy it. But the guy thinks he's clever and he blocks the camera's view so you don't see the code. You're screwed, right? Uh, no, because there happens to be a mirror right beside the door, which you can look at and see a reflection of what he's doing. That alone, pretty clever. But then once you remember to mirror his inputs because you're seeing it through a mirror, those extra steps really make you feel like the world's greatest detective. Dressing like a bat is only half the equation. Uh, and although this isn't the hardest, and in some ways it's actually pretty obvious, it's also one of the ones that does snag some people. Yeah, but it's also number 10, so it's only uphill from here. This is taking too long. Brute force works too, I guess. And number nine is the Fool's Idol secret in Demon Souls, the first Souls-like, had a fascination with trick bosses. Most of the boss fights in this game aren't real fights like you've come to expect from the series. There's often just some kind of trick or gimmick to them. Most memorable is the Fool's Idol, which is the boss of World 3-1. When you enter the area, this thing descends from the sky and fights you like a standard boss, but for whatever reason, it's like impossible to kill. There's nothing you can do, seriously. If you just enter the boss arena, she's gonna revive endlessly. There is a way to defeat this boss, but you have to think outside the box. Overlooking the church, you can find this random guy who tells you to buzz off if you get close to him. What? What do you want? I am a humble servant. I do not wish to interfere. I won't cause you trouble. I won't. But it looks like he's channeling some kind of ritual or something. There's no prompt or anything on what you're supposed to do here, and he kind of just seems like a basic NPC. But if you want to kill the fool's idol, you're going to have to take care of this guy. So it means you just have to attack him totally unprovoked, which means you're basically breaking two basic game design tenets. That you're not supposed to just attack NPCs and that the solution to a boss fight can actually happen outside the arena. The biggest clue is the name, uh, Fool's Idol, implies there's some kind of illusion going on and the guy up on the balcony is the man behind the curtain. You deal with him, the illusion breaks. It's a puzzle that's the equal parts brilliant and maddening. And number eight is Mass Effect 2, completing the suicide mission without anyone dying. When you think about it, the final mission of Mass Effect 2 is basically just one big puzzle. It's all about figuring out what characters to use and when to get the best outcome. It's not random or inexplicable. Most of the time, there's a logic to how characters live or die and, uh, well, your choices generally make sense with how they correlate with outcome. Most of the choices, like completing everyone's loyalty missions and getting the ship upgraded, make perfect sense. But then once you're actually in the middle of the suicide mission, some of the choices start getting more dicey. For example, the part where you need somebody to generate a force field, there's a lot of biotic focused characters. I wouldn't be able to protect everyone, but we might be able to get a small team through if they stayed close. I could do it too. In theory, any biotic could handle it. Shepard, who do you want to maintain the field? But you want to use the ones that are considered the best, like Morden is a doctor, not a fighter, so you don't want to leave him to hold the line, because he's going to probably die. I mean, he kind of does that uh, spin-off of the modern Major General song, the Scientist Solarian thing. 
I am the very model of a scientist Salarian. I've studied species Turian, Asari, and Batarian. That's not somebody who survives that kind of situation. And there's often multiple good choices, but during the final mission, a good choice often isn't good enough. You need to make the best choice. There's a ton of possibilities here, and while it's not exactly what most people think of as a traditional puzzle, it requires some pretty serious mental calculus to figure out the best possible outcomes. And if you don't treat it like a puzzle, like a serious problem to solve, mentally speaking, you're probably not gonna have everybody come back out with you. Grunt's group just arrived, Shepard. No casualties. Excellent. Now let's make it count. And number seven, uh, recovering the Master Sword in Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. One of the central mysteries in this game is where is Princess Zelda? And depending on how somebody plays the game, it's something they discover right at the start or it takes dozens of hours to figure it out. It's sort of a puzzle on its own because the game never straight up tells you where Zelda is. The best you'll get is someone pinpointing where the Master Sword is, so it just so happens to be the same spot Zelda is in. Hmm. and for some reason it's moving. I'm gonna spoiler warn you here, just cause. Um, if you haven't played it, it could be a, a, a big one, potentially. So uh, skip a little bit if you don't want something from Zelda spoiled. It's a relatively new game, so obviously it's a courteous thing for me to do here. Um, so there's a big eureka moment that comes for a lot of people. Uh, they figure out Zelda changed into a dragon and then figure out that she's kind of just flying around Hyrule and you can get to her at pretty much any time. Like as long as you're lucky enough to see her and have a way up, you can find Zelda and recover the Master Sword at any point in the game, assuming you meet the stamina requirement. What's interesting here is you're probably gonna feel smart no matter what. For the people who took a long time to find it, the clues finally come together and make it clear what your goal actually is. Where people who notice there's a new dragon flying around and try to reach it are rewarded for their curiosity by getting the Master Sword much earlier than intended. In any other game, this wouldn't be something to realize. It would be a story event that happens no matter what. The way you have to kind of put two and two together, uh, even though they've given you both twos, it's still clever and unique and it does make you feel like a genius. And number six, all the clues coming together in the return of Orba Din, an extremely unusual puzzle game, and it feels like you're just guessing at first until it just suddenly hits you just how much information the game is actually giving you. Your goal here is to explore a doomed ship. Uh, you experience like moments in history and identify all the crewmen and their cause of death. It's a detective game in every sense of the word, but there's one curious difference. There's no notes. It seems like the game's giving you nothing to go on, especially if you're used to games that carefully celebrate puzzle elements from story elements, but here they're one and the same. Take for example the identities and fates of the four Chinese topmen. There's almost no information on these guys, all you have is their names and that's about it, but a crucial detail can be found in their shoes that tells you who each one is. In any other detective game, they make a big deal about it, or allow you to highlight the shoes, or give you a big button prompt to examine them, but this game, it all comes down to deductive reasoning and paying attention to seemingly minuscule details. Once you realize everything is a clue in the game, it becomes way less frustrating and you feel way smarter. And number five is the Holy Cross in Tunic. Discovering the secret meaning of the Holy Cross in Tunic is when the game goes from being a kind of interesting indie to one of the best puzzle games out there. The premise, already pretty clever to be completely honest. You're dropped into this world with no idea of what's really going on or really even how to perform basic controls. And as you explore, you unlock new pages of the instruction manual. The problem is the manual's written in a fake language, which leaves it up to you to figure out what it's actually telling you. So, for a lot of people, the Holy Cross discovery just comes naturally at some point. You notice all these weird golden objects with patterns on them, and you look at the Holy Cross and it dawns on people, it looks a lot like a D-pad. When it all falls into place, and the first time you try inputting a code and it actually works, it's like you're seeing the Matrix. So many people assume that the Holy Cross is just some item you get in the game that functions like a key, but it's actually something you kind of had the whole time but didn't know how to use. 
And number four, the secret codec message in Metal Gear Solid. Speaking of Metatrix, let's talk about one of the originals. You probably heard of this one before, but it really can't be understated how mind-blowing this was for people who were able to experience it the intended way. Now, of course, 20 years later, the puzzles viewed very differently, and for good reason, but at the time, it really was a brilliant idea. To quickly explain what I'm talking about here, at a certain point in Metal Gear Solid, on the PS1, you gotta find the codec frequency for Meryl. Normally, people just give you a number and you dial it and you'd be able to talk to them, but for Meryl, nobody knows what the frequency is. You only get one cryptic clue to use the number on the back of the CD case. In any case, you should contact Meryl by codec. Wasn't her frequency written on the back of the CD case? For most people, their first thought would be to look around in-game for a CD case somewhere, or to check their inventory, but when the game says CD case, they meant the CD case, the case that the CD's in, for Cusco. I mean, for the game. So you look on the back of the original box, which, by the way, I still have, and there's a screenshot that has a codec number on it, and that's the codec you need. Obviously, for people who do not play the game on PS1, it is a pretty annoying puzzle, because there's no box. There's no CD case. I mean, even if you rented the game back in the day, those came in a blockbuster or like a pretend blockbuster case. I don't know. Different world, guys. Different world. It was a cool thing when it clicked, though. You're like, oh, oh wow, that's cool. And number three is the Talos Principle, the Prison Break. What makes this such a great puzzle game is how it finds a way to expand your mind while still keeping the nature of its puzzles consistent. With just some simple mechanics like connectors, boxes, and fans, this game is able to put together something absolutely brutal. Uh, it can seem, like, impossible at first, but there's gonna be a point where you just suddenly get it. I'm not gonna talk about the toughest puzzle in the game, but rather one of the best ones. Prison Break seems like a pretty straightforward one at first. There's like a lot of lasers to connect and doors to unlock. But the big set piece of the puzzle is these two fans. They seem pretty pointless at first, but they're actually essential to solve the puzzle. Because of the first person camera, it can be hard to think about the puzzles in a three-dimensional space. When a wall or an object breaks your laser connection, your first instinct is that the connection just won't work. But here it's essential to connect up to something that is unreachable, at least at first. That's because the trick here is to put a connector on top of the box under the fan, which raises both things up so they can hit two faraway connections and keep the fan going at the same time. It's hard to explain just how brilliant this is, but it's a puzzle where it really seems like anything is possible. And it makes the Talos principle feel that way by proxy. You just have to think a couple steps ahead. And number two is the Outer Wilds figuring out the rules of quantum entanglement. In a game filled with brain expanding puzzles and secrets, figuring out the rules of quantum objects and eventually reaching the quantum moon, they're basically unforgettable. Hidden all over the solar system are clues about how quantum works, how you can observe it, and how you can eventually interact with it. It's probably the most challenging and complex puzzle in the game, in fact. Putting it all together can be difficult even when the game basically spells it out for you. Uh, it's an awesome feeling, too, when you finally make it all come together. Just getting to the quantum moon feels like a friggin' magic trick. The moon appears in one of five spots around the solar system, but if you're not observing it, then it moves. Literally look away and the moon is gonna be gone. And even if you do keep an eye on it when you're trying to cross into its atmosphere, the atmosphere blinds you momentarily, so that means you can't see the moon, so that means it moves. I absolutely love this. Uh, so how do you get through? Well, you take a picture of the moon. Yeah, while you're flying through the atmosphere, take a picture of it. And then when you're looking at that picture, you're observing the moon, and it doesn't move. So how do you get it to move while you're on it? Well, you go into a room, and you turn off all the lights, and then it's perfectly dark, and you really can't observe anything. So the moon moves while you're on it. It's one of these puzzles that's just super mind-blowing, and super internally consistent. It's intimidating as hell trying to piece everything together, but when all the clues come into place, the Quantum Moon is just one of the best puzzles of all time.
And finally at number one, Baba is you. And I'm just going to say everything. There's there's not a lot of games where you just feel like a genius and a total idiot at the same time. But Baba is you is, it's one of those games that does that. It starts off really deceptively simple. It's just a puzzle game where you solve a bunch of rules, starting with Baba is you. Meaning you have direct control of the sheep sprite called Baba. Your goal is to create a win condition and you achieve this through any means necessary. At first, this is really simple, but it quickly becomes uh, pretty overwhelming with just how complex it is. At a certain point, it's more of a programming game than a puzzle game, but once you start getting into the advanced stuff, that's where the real brain melters begin. There's so many things you can do this game that sound like they shouldn't be possible, like literally duplicating words or putting two words in a single place, and they're not exploits, they're sometimes required puzzle solutions. It's one of those games where either your brain grows five sizes, putting the Grinch's heart to shame, or you just tap out. It's one of the hardest puzzle games out there, and it just keeps going. Somehow this game has multiple thousand IQ moments in it, even if most people probably will never get that far. Uh, for the people who do, it is a hell of a dopamine hit, and you just walk around feeling like you could probably trick anybody into anything. A quick bonus for you too, The Witness, uh, we gotta mention it, but it's in bonus just because you knew that The Witness was this, and we have talked about it quite a lot. But it's really just one of these all-time great puzzle game moments. Like a good chunk of the game, it seems like the world and the puzzles are completely disconnected, and you start noticing that they're not. All these little patterns like start to show up, and you're like, oh, wait, that's is that also? Nah, that's gotta just be some kind of like consistency in the art. Let's test it though. And then you're like, oh shit, dude, that is a puzzle. Like everybody who plays The Witness has that moment, that very specific moment. But how long it takes to get there can vary pretty wildly from person to person. There are some that get it immediately, like, uh, you know, really smart people and also everybody who has seen this video. Oh, wait, that's the same group. It's only really smart people who are watching this video. <laughs> Yes, that that's right. Flattery is, is my attempt to get you to engage in the comments and likes and subscriptions and all that. Uh, otherwise, I'd have chosen this second thing. Um, not being able to figure it out at all. You know, just taking before the game is done before it hits them. Which this really smart group of people watching this video doesn't overlap with at all. It's just that kind of game. They don't give you any direct clues about this, and they just leave it up to you to discover it. And eventually you have to, and it's freaking awesome. You don't even really solve a puzzle per se, just the puzzle of the fact that there are puzzles. And that's all for today. Leave us a comment. Let us know what you think. I assume it's going to be something pretty positive, which would also lead you to the like button, which you should click. Um, if you're not subscribed, now's a great time to do so. We upload brand new videos every day of the week. Best way to see them first is, of course, a subscription, so click subscribe. Don't forget to enable notifications, and as always, we thank you very much for watching this video. I'm Falcon. You can follow me on Twitter at FalconTheHero, and we'll see you next time right here on Game Ranks.